Welcome to the Power of Culture. I'm Al Mayasa bint Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani. My nation, Qatar, is on a creative journey supporting the talents of a rising generation, reaching out to other countries through the arts and building an entire cultural infrastructure. In each episode of The Power of Culture, I'm joined by a leading artist or architect, philanthropist or museum professional who is part of Qatar's journey. Listen in as we discuss what the power of culture can do. Hello, Glenn. How are you? Very well. Hello, Your Excellency. I'm very happy to speak to you today, the curator, writer and historian, but also you are the curator and director of Doha Design Biennale, our new Biennale for Doha. Um, could you let me know what's attracted you to working in the city and country and in particular this project that I, I know, I believe we've been talking about for a long time now? Yes, that's right. It's been about two years in the making, at least, and it's such an exciting project. I have to say that Qatar was actually new to me uh, when we started working together, Your Excellency. I uh, hadn't had a chance to visit before, I think, 2019, just before the pandemic. And um, it's just been such an incredible experience getting to know the country, getting to know the people, and especially for me, getting to know the design scene. And I know we'll say a lot more about this over the course of the interview. But what's really struck me is that Qatar has really become a design destination. Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the World Cup, of course, uh, the creation of the stadiums, the metro, the other infrastructure. But it's been happening for a long time. You know, you look at the museum building that's been going on ever since I.M. Pei's uh, Museum for Islamic Art, or you think about the 20 years of teaching that uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University's campus in Qatar, has been offering to students from Qatar and the region. And it's really a place that's made a huge investment in design for a long time. So for me, Design Doha, this new biennial, is really an opportunity to focus those existing energies and let the world know what's going on. It's really interesting that you mentioned the World Cup because in studying all the stadiums, it's really a big design statement in itself, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's an incredible collection of architecture and it's very curated. I'm not sure how many people really understood this fully because, of course, the emphasis was rightly on the, the, the games, you know, the sport itself. And boy, the games were amazing, weren't they? Um, but, you know, the range of architecture, both by uh, international and also regional architects uh, that was created for the World Cup was absolutely extraordinary. Um, we're particularly excited to be working with Ibrahim al Jada who is, um, I would say, Qatar's most eminent architect. And he created one of the stadiums for the World Cup, Altumama Stadium, very much based on local sources, local imagery, beautifully built and conceived building. And we're featuring that as part of an exhibition within the biennial, which is called Colors of the City. Uh, it tells the story of 100 years of architecture in Doha and actually culminates with a look at his his Altumama Stadium. So that's just one example of the many stories we get to tell. I really look forward to the 100 years of architecture in Qatar or Doha. Uh, as I don't think, as you said about the stadiums, how it was carefully selected and curated. You know, the Altumama Stadium uh, was inspired by the Gahfiya, which every young boy and uh, male adult wears in our culture, not just in Qatar, but also the region. And so that's very, really symbolic of the unity mm. the World Cup uh, provided for the, for, for the Arab world. Mm. But um, something about architecture that you said that struck me, many people also when they come to Qatar, they tell me one of the first things they say is Qatar feels like an architectural museum because from the airport to the various zones in the country, it's very prominent to see uh, the different uh, architectural buildings, many Pritzker Prize architects have built things. And I think there's a very fine line that divides design with architecture. Uh, talk a little bit more about the exhibition that you're working on, on the 100 years of architecture in Qatar and how you think that is linked to the Doha Design Biennale. Sure. Yeah, it's a fascinating exhibition. And again, this was a huge discovery for me because it's not a story that I knew myself. But, you know, when you think about architecture in Doha, people who have visited uh, might think back to the 1980s, maybe the creation of the Sheraton Hotel. That might be the first monument that they think about historically. But it turns out that Qatar has had this incredible legacy of modernist architecture going all the way back to the 1920s and 30s. 
And we've been working with a wonderful historian who works at Cotter Museums, who's called Dr. Peter Naj. And he, like uh, Mr. Aljeda, the architect I mentioned before, has done a great deal of research into the history of Cotter's response to um, Art Deco initially, you know, coming out of France in the 1920s, and then the subsequent currents of modernism that happened in the 30s coming out of the Bauhaus, and then ultimately the brutalist um, architecture of the 1960s and 70s. And I guess you could actually say that the Sheraton Hotel itself is a is a, an expression of that. But rather than being the first um, major architectural monument that people think of, it's actually one of the later ones in the chronology. So that's a really good example of where we're able to dig into a history that people don't know very well. I should mention that um, Mr. Al Jada has also just published a wonderful book, which is called Arabic Art Deco, which is just out from Rizzoli. So people can also see that book if they don't have a chance to travel and see the, the exhibition itself. Yeah, it's really an amazing book, but the Sheraton is iconic. It's also where Qatar's biggest uh, mediation deals have been happening, mm. you know, it's so famous for that as well in mm. terms of our foreign policy. So it's interesting that our oldest hotel um, that has such a design uh, architectural influence and many of those who lived in Qatar, but also visited through the years, is also a place for, for uh, mediation and, and peacekeeping. Mm. Uh, let me move to the question about craft. I, I personally find craft to be such an intimate experience from one human to another. Um, and I know from our early conversation, that's something that's very attract You're very attracted to the idea of craft and preserving craft and uh, translating it into contemporary everyday uh, use um, or awareness, let, let's say. Tell me more about why you have dedicated much of your writing to the importance of craft. Mm. So this is a deep subject for me, and it goes all the way back to when I was in college. So I guess I would have been 19 or 20 years old, and I had an opportunity to take a course on Chinese ceramics. Uh, so this was really ancient and I guess you might say medieval pottery. And I had a chance to handle some of these objects. I remember particularly this one uh, three color, three glazed dish from the Tang Dynasty and, you know, the curator putting that in my hands and just having this feeling of incredible connection not only over space, but also over time, because that was, you know, a, a thousand year old object. And there's something about the intimacy of that, as you said, Your Excellency, and the kind of indirect touching of another person's hands that you can have when you hold an object like that in yours. And I often think that my whole career is just an attempt to live up to that moment and others like it. You know, you have these experiences, not only of objects and artifacts, but also of people's workshops or spaces that they've created. Obviously the ideas that drive craft and the traditions and uh, sometimes ceremonial, sometimes cultural associations that come along with craft. And um, it just is an extraordinary arena to explore. And then when you start thinking about how it relates to other disciplines like architecture or fine art or design itself, it just seems to have an endless um, an endless potential for exploration. And I'll, I'll say that um, particularly in the region, you know, what we call the MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa, which we're focusing on for Design Doha, you know, craft is such an important part of the design story. There's really no way to pull them apart. So I find that dialogue between the two spheres of activity uh, to be really rich and, and really sustaining. You present ceramics strongly in the Design Doha Biennale. Would you say that through your experience um, in visiting the region and deciding what we're going to show in the 2024 Biennale, what, what do you think excited you the most and why, why think about ceramics as, a, as an element that can be exhibited in, in an exhibition like the Design Doha Biennale? Mm, yeah. Well, as I say, my career really started with ceramics and has, it's always been my greatest love. You know, whenever I go to a museum, that's always what I seek out. And in fact, I'll just mention it's, it's not about the Biennale, but on my last trip to Qatar, um, there was an extraordinary presentation of the works of Raku Kichizaiman, who's the latest exponent of this great uh, family tradition in Japan of Raku pottery. And that uh, work was actually made using clay sourced from Qatar and then was presented at the Museum for Islamic Art, the I.M. Pei building I mentioned earlier. So, you know, it's a great tradition within Qatar Museums itself, the 
presentation of ceramics. And of course, it's a very rich tradition in the region. You know, think about the importance of tile work, especially, and the way that ceramics and architecture inform one another in the MENA region. One thing I'll mention specifically is that it's been great to get to know the work of this young Qatari uh, ceramist who's called Abdul Rahman Al Mufta. And he's one of a I think a global movement really of um, younger artists who are interested in what they call wild clay. So the idea here is that instead of ordering the clay from Amazon, you actually go out into the countryside and you dig your own clay. And of course, what you get is a very specific local product that then has to be refined before it can be used in the studio. And so it's a kind of investigation of the local terrain that you would really only get in that medium. And that's been fascinating to learn about. It's interesting that you say, you talk about Raku because his ceramic exhibition was pretty much influenced by his experience in Qatar, but also it was one of our World Cup presentations for the new Lucille Museum that we're starting construction this year. But also the Qatari uh, ceramist that you mentioned, or Potter, Al Muftah, he's also, I know, has created uh, very interesting works for the design Doha Biennale. And um, what's really interesting uh, to me when I observe the creatives that are coming out from Qatar in particular, whether Qatari or local, but also in the region, as many of them are going back to the medium of clay, which is also very present in our permanent galleries and collections, whether at the National Museum of Qatar or the Museum of Islamic Art. And throughout your personal writings and exhibitions, you have tirelessly championed craft as something intimately involved in fine arts and industry, and there's no separation between the two. Um, I know that you said that the first inspiration was at college, but would you say your passion began then, or was it something that inf that influenced you throughout your childhood, throughout different experiences, or or really was it uh, during your college years that you, you became passionate for this, for the idea of craft? You know, I did have the wonderful experience of uh, watching my grandfather carve wood. He was an amateur um, craftsman, professional aircraft engineer, actually. That's what he did for a living. But on the weekend, he would uh, carve these pictures in wood. And that was probably my first really deep experience of craft. The ceramics thing didn't really come along until college for me. Um, but then, you know, like I said, it was love at first sight. And I guess, you, you know, one thing I would add, Your Excellency, is that you're absolutely right that ceramics is art and it is industry. And of course, the other thing it is, is, is exchange. You know, if you think about the history of global trade, maybe the most um, emblematic of all artifacts that were exchanged, perhaps along with Indian textiles, would have been Chinese ceramics. And so this sense that you have uh, ceramic objects traveling through the MENA region historically that feels like a really important um, backdrop for what we're doing today. And I, that's one reason why I think ceramics has such a large role to play in the presentations that we're making, because uh, ceramics has always been an index, not just of place, but also of the way that people exchange ideas and forms and aesthetics across space. And of course, the MENA region has been one of the most active crossing points, you know, most active nexuses of, um, of that kind of interchange between peoples over the centuries. And um, in your book, Fewer Better Things, uh, The Wisdom of Objects, you know, you, you begin with a note to your childhood teddy bear. And you, ob you observe that children today are more likely to be glued to a tablet, unfortunately. Are you mindful of this? Are you hopeful or fearful for this future for children and the next generation of creatives? Mm. It's a really hard question. Um, that that book, uh, Fewer Better Things, I also actually talk about my grandfather there, um, the, the woodcarver. And obviously I was born just pre-digital. You know, I was born in 1972, so I didn't have a computer until I was a teenager. And I do wonder what it's like for kids now. I often say we're running an experiment without a control group. You know, we're just plunging all of humanity almost simultaneously into this new reality or hyper reality where they're experiencing the world through this frictionless sort of infinitely metamorphic portal where they can feel like they can see anything and do anything but of course what they're actually doing is just sitting there with this little device in their hands and sort of 
poking at it with their finger, which in a way is a very limited experience, very narrow experience. Um, so I don't want to come across as a technophobe, um, but I think it's really important that we just seek balance between the incredible power that these digital devices are bringing to us and the richness of the analog experience, you know, the physical experience of craft. And I do think that's something that comes across very strongly in um, contemporary design in general, certainly, but also in the region. You know, there's a lot of um, designers that we'll be featuring in Design Doha who are really bridging between the analog and the digital very adroitly and in super interesting ways. So that's one of the things that people will see when they come to see the um, exhibitions. No, I agree with you. I think technology has really enabled also designers to, you know, realize their vision and dreams. I mean, one could also look at the National Museum of Qatar and Jean Nouvel's Desert Rose. If it wasn't for technology, we would never have been able to realize that vision. Um, but before I continue on about the technology, I want to go back to your experience as a child with your grandfather as a woodcarver, because I was having a discussion earlier with, with someone who also learned through his childhood how to do woodworking, which unfortunately I would say many men today and women don't know how to do woodworking. And we were talking about this discussion about basic skills that people, everyone should know, um, no matter how advanced you are, no matter how um, technical you may be. Uh, what would you say, you know, as someone who's very involved in our design thinking, and in, in how we're trying to, you know, introduce design thinking to young people and children and also families. How, how important in your point of view is it to in, reintroduce something like woodworking, design technology in schools and in the curriculums overall in our region? Now that you've experienced and seen the talent we've had, can you fine tune these skills so that everybody has a basic knowledge and also empowered with basic skills that should they want to pursue a career in craftsmanship or artisanship, um, they have the basic know-how. Yeah, it's so important. You know, I would compare it almost to teaching a kid how to read, you know, which of course nobody would think of raising their child illiterate now, but we do that with um, what I would call object literacy all the time. Or another way I like to describe it is material intelligence you know, the ability to manipulate and also understand the material world around you. It just seems like a, such a fundamental human capacity. And yet it's one that we seem to be getting increasingly divorced from. Um, and, you know, that's one reason why I think under your leadership, the creation of this um, not only design academy effectively at VCU, but also the new idea of a vocational school, which will be headquartered at the Qatar Preparatory School, you know, beautiful um, older building in Qatar um, will be devoted to the propagation of these skills. And obviously that's that's not for kids necessarily. It's more for college or university age, but it's so important to keep those skills going and have them kind of flow into the design and art scene. You know, it's really in many ways the lifeblood of creativity, your ability to pick up a tool and express yourself begins with your ability to understand that tool, understand the material. And I think we, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a legacy of conceptual art from the 20th century too, that there's this idea that the idea itself is all you need, but that's very, very rarely true. Even in the most avant-garde artistic circumstances, people really need to have a deep skill set to rely on in order to express themselves and in order to explore those conceptual aspects of what they're doing. And that's certainly true in design as well. I couldn't agree more with you. I think um, eventually our goal would be to ensure that every child learns those basic skills, uh, just as we insist on them learning math, science, reading. I think that these skills are just so important for whatever they end up doing in life. Mm. Now, let's go back to you, uh, Glenn. You've worked uh, in both London and New York at the V&A Museum in London, and also you were the director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. And these two cities are very different, but also very similar in nature. What energy do you think you take from those two very different cities? And how does that compare to Doha, which compared to the the investments in arts and culture uh, to both London and New York is a relatively young city? Yes, relatively young, but also in some ways taking the best of both in a way. And what I mean by that is that in the UK, 
and the V&A is such a good example of this, you know, major national museum like the British Museum or uh, the Tate. And it relies very heavily on uh, government funding, you know, really taxpayer money to do its work. Whereas in New York City, you have a totally different structure where it's really private philanthropy. And both of those systems have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, you know, it's it, it can be absolutely amazing to feel that you have the weight of public funding behind you. And that creates a lot of space for research and exploratory um, curatorial work. But of course, it's also a huge bureaucracy. I used to joke in England that the only thing that the British had kept from their empire was the paperwork. <laughs> and it was, it was really an extraordinary thing to try to navigate that. And then obviously in New York, and any curator or director will tell you this, there's just a lot of time spent on the diplomacy side of trying to organize funding, you know, recruit board members, stakeholders. And that can be a wonderful experience. It was for me. But it also is a very um, challenging environment, particularly when, you know, you're in a nonprofit sector that itself is being stressed by something like COVID, for example. And what's fascinating to me in Doha is that you have, in a way, a kind of combination of what I would describe as a kind of enlightened um, patronage structure, which borrows from the American model, and also a sense of a kind of coherence of um, governmental uh, intention and programming. I think that is partly a matter of scale. Uh, it's not only a younger art sector, but obviously it is much smaller than what you would have in the United States. You know, it's really one one city and then a, a couple of smaller uh, metropolises in, in Qatar. But I do think still that for the youth of the scene there institutionally, there's also a kind of maturity and sophistication that's built on the understanding of what has been happening in these other parts of the world. And of course, I, I know New York and London best, but I think that you and others in Qatar have also been drawing lessons from what's happening elsewhere in the region, obviously in East Asia and elsewhere in the world. So it's it's a really sophisticated museum operation happening uh, with Qatar museums and something I've learned a lot from myself. Wouldn't you agree that, um, I mean, if we just talk about Qatar, that becomes a very small pool of talent, but wouldn't you agree that... Um, Qatar as a whole has really pursued the incubation of Arab talent or regional talent, whether you're Arab or non-Arab, but living in the region to support the growth of um, creativity in all of its field. But if we just focus on the Design Doha Biennale, which opens very soon, I'm very excited about this initiative. I feel like we've been talking about it for and working on it for a few years now and finally seeing the realization of it with your efforts and your team, it's really a rewarding moment for me personally. But how different or how similar, in your opinion, would you say that the Arab scene is compared to Europe and the US, where you know quite well? Well, in terms of design, again, it's a younger scene. Um, and it is a scene that hasn't had the kind of focal points that, let's say, the Victorian Albert Museum um, or the Cooper Hewitt and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York would give it. So this is all quite new. Um, obviously, design and especially craft have been happening in the region, you know, as long as there have been people uh, in the region. That's nothing new at all. It's really the kind of curatorial museum level focus that we're able to give it. And, you know, sometimes I'm asked to explain the difference between Design Doha and something like uh, Design Week in Dubai, for example. And really, the difference is that our model is not so commercial. It's really museum based. So we're operating principally through um, museum exhibitions. And then we also have some commissions and um, an exciting exchange program with Morocco. But it's really all very much aimed at a, a kind of high level achievement and an educational purpose, as you say, to in incubate talent. And of course, the hope is that then creating that, that um, opportunity it's sort of like, you know, building a tent with a really high ceiling. It just creates a lot of space for people to operate. And the hope is that then there will be a lot of commercial success following that. But as we go ahead with the biennial every two years, that, that will continue to be our focus to really offer a museum quality experience and a very carefully curated selection of what's happening in Qatar and in the region. That's really, that's really the goal. And it is very consistent with what's been happening in the country um, up to this point. I think about these incubation hubs like the fire station or Liwan, um, where you have these really world-class studios that are being offered to um, sometimes graduating students or more established uh, figures in art and design. 
And so there's just a world of opportunity there and you're starting to really see the effect of it just in terms of the caliber of work that's being produced. It's interesting you talk about commissions and there's a number of things that I would love for you to speak to uh, our audiences about. The first being the Moroccan commission uh, uh, because of the culture diplomacy program uh, or year or culture year of uh, between Qatar and Morocco in 2024. Um, the other two commissions I'd love you also to talk about is the technology used in the work of Joris Larsman, which mm -hmm. is a permanent uh, installation, but also the work of the Korean uh, designer, yeah, Choi. Choi Byung yeah. Um, yeah. Could you speak a bit about those three very different commissions and how by introducing them to our audiences, whether in Qatar or the region or even internationally, as you know, Qatar is a very international destination. You know, how, how does that add value to the design scene, but also the way we think about the impact of urban space and design thinking in our everyday lives as we make decisions um, in how we approach things? Yeah. So so really here, the effort is to, first of all, go beyond the museum walls. I should have said that the main museum where we'll be presenting Design Doha is M7, which is right in the heart of the design district, the Meshreb. Uh, in downtown Doha. So that's really our headquarters for the whole um, biennial and that will have all of our major exhibitions in it. But we also did want to go beyond the walls and create these commissions elsewhere in the city. So there are three that we've been able to achieve for this first uh, biennial and hopefully we'll be doing similar things in future editions. And as you mentioned, uh, the first of those is by a Moroccan artist named Amin al a wonderful artist who also has just created a sensational installation for Somerset House in London. And what he's done is this very impressive wall piece made of wool, which he's sourcing in Qatar, and also um, metal, which will be hung on the um, atrium wall of the newly opened Ned Hotel in Doha. Wonderful Wouldn't you say venue. that's a design gem, the Ned Doha with oh. David Chipperfield and... It's phenomenal. So house operation. And in fact, you know, that's a great example of a building, you know, it was a civic building that was made in that brutalist style that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but you know, it's an older building and Chipperfield's reimagination of it is just absolutely stunning. You know, you can't believe it as you walk from one space to the next, how beautifully paced it is and how dramatic, but also restful and resonant those spaces are. And I think Amin al uh piece is sort of the crowning um, contribution to that architectural setting, you know, it's warmth and subtlety but also visual power and scale, I think will really provide the sense of completion. And so that's a permanent acquisition for Qatar museums. And that that's really important to us that there's a legacy for the biennial. It's not just that the exhibitions come and go, but we're also going to be acquiring a lot from the biennial. And we also have these public commissions. So just briefly to mention the other two, these are really the only two uh, major th things that we're doing from outside the region and they're important and wonderful in their own right. So one is a series of basalt seating sculptures that Choi Byung-hoon, the leading uh, stone sculptor in South Korea, is making for the Baraha or courtyard of the National Museum of Qatar. And um, among the objects that he's making for us is the largest single monolithic sculpture that he's ever made. It's something like five meters in length of hand-carved Indonesian basalt, and that will provide a place of rest uh, and reflection in the middle of this extraordinary Jean Nouvel building. So that's a major achievement. And then again, over in the design district uh, downtown in the Meshreb, we have this amazing kind of jaw-dropping object that uh, Joris Larman has created called the Doha Dragon. And I call it an object, but it's almost of architectural scale. It's something like 10 meters long, and it's made of 3D printed metal and sand. If you can imagine this, it's like a serpentine um, twisting form. This is why he calls it the dragon that's made using a bespoke technology called MX3D that he invented himself that allows you to deposit metal in free space using this kind of robotic arm hybridized with a printer. And it's a very sci-fi futuristic thing and just a perfect example of that union between the digital and the analog that we were talking about earlier, Your Excellency. So I think it's a real centerpiece for not just the biennial, but will be for the district going forward. And again, a major addition to the permanent legacy of uh, design and art and public art, especially in Doha. 
It's interesting that Choi uses Indonesian basalt. We just concluded the celebration of the Qatar Indonesia Year of Culture in 2023. And Indonesia is a country that has invested heavily in CCIs, including design and the creative industry in general. I, I think, in fact, they have a minister just for that uh, portfolio, reflecting how important it is for the economies of countries. I want to just tell you, or I, maybe you know this already, but one of our guests at the design Doha this year is David Chipperfield. So he'll be touring the NED and talking about his building and his thinking about preserving old buildings and converting it into, you know, from civic building to hospitality. And um, with the talent in the region and the opportunities are only increasing uh, as I see it. If there's one thing for industry people, such as hospitality, hotels, etc., or inter interior designers, distributors of design, what would you um, say not to miss at the Design Doha Biennale? Mm. Well, you know, I think the, the key principle here is really the, that of um, the individual voice, because, you know, when you hear hospitality industry or, you know, think about the development of major infrastructure, of course, you think about big systems and you have to, you know, it, that's just a necessary part of it. But featuring um, the kind of personal insight of somebody like Chipperfield or even an artist like Amina Gataibi, I think would be, um, I would be remiss if I didn't make an argument for just holding that as a key principle of these large scale projects. And that's, of course, something that has happened so beautifully in Doha over the, the years. You know, you see not just the scale of the enterprise, the museums, the hotels, the stadium, the metro, as we've been talking about, but also the individual character of the people that have shaped it. Um, and I think if if there were w one thing to see and uh, design Doha, hopefully people will see everything, but it would definitely be our headline exhibition, which is called Arab Design Now. So that will be at M7. It's curated for us by this fantastic, talented young curator from Amman in Jordan, who's called Rana Beiruti. And she spent two years now assembling this absolutely all-star, stellar cast of designers from across the region, almost 100 designers. And the um, exhibition will be presented in uh, both floors at M7. So this is where people might have seen exhibitions like Valentino or Dior if they've been to M7 in the past. And so the entire major exhibition space is being devoted to this survey show. And it is absolutely extraordinary. There will be a publication that goes along with it as well. Um, coming out in the spring once we have installation photography. So that's that's also, um, I think, a major achievement for us because it just allows us to, um, I think, establish a kind of permanent record and a sense of what is actually happening in the region. It creates not only a brilliant experience for this biennial, but also a foundation for us to build on in the future. No, it's really exciting. And um, how long is the design Doha Biennale? Oh, yeah. So the opening week is the 24th to the 28th of February. So coming right up. And then the exhibitions uh, last for various amounts of time. So uh, Colors of the City, the architecture show that I mentioned earlier, and also a wonderful project that we're doing with Turquoise Mountain, the nonprofit, um, and an Afghan-born weaver uh, named Mariam Omar. That show is called Weaving Songs, and that's also going to be at M7, along with a sort of um, showcase of graphic design from the region, focusing on 100 posters. Those shows will all be on through April. And then Arab Design Now, the headline show, will be on through August 5th. So it, in a way, the biennial goes all the way through the summer. That's great. It gives people a lot of time and opportunity to really explore the talent of our region with over, I think, 80 designers participating. But uh, central to Design Doha is our newly launched uh, Doha Design Prize, what is this all about? Can you tell our audience um, how they can apply or what the reward is about and how will winners receive and be supported through this initiative? Sure. And here I have to give credit to my wonderful colleague, Fahad Alobadli, who's based in Qatar um, and a fantastic talent, not only a fashion designer, which is what he does when he's not busy with us on Design Doha, but also an absolutely uh, terrific impresario and communicator. And he's really taking the lead on creating this prize, which is going to be offered to designers who are citizens or residents of the MENA region. So again, Middle East or North Africa. 
And it's really an amazing opportunity for younger designers. Um, we're looking at four categories, product design, interior design, furniture, and crafts. And in those categories, we'll be identifying four recipients. And each of them will get a considerable cash prize, 100,000 Qatari Rial um, each. And then we also will be offering them ongoing mentorship and market exposure, logistical support, even insurance for uh, works that they might uh, be creating and shipping and displaying. And what, what we'll be doing between this 2024 biennial and the next one in 2026 is looking for opportunities to showcase these prize winners and probably also some of the commissions that we've created for our design now in the international design scene. So really trying to project the considerable talent of the MENA region elsewhere where people might not otherwise have a chance to see it and benefit from it. And the prize is really a kind of core uh, core aspect of what we're doing in that respect. And do you want to say a bit more ab about the Arab Design Now exhibition? Do you want to discuss the different arts, the different representations, um, and how you know how these designers were selected? Sure. So as I mentioned, uh, that curation has been done by Rana Beiruti. She was the founder of Amman Design Week in Jordan, so very experienced and had a great network in the region already, which I, I guess she would probably agree she's only built through the process of doing all of this research and putting this show together. And I might just mention a few of the really outstanding designers that we have as part of it. We've been talking a lot about Morocco because we do have this year of culture partnership with them. So we have an exchange program and we have, as we've said, Amin al Ghattabi's work being created for the Neda Hotel. We also have um, some wonderful Moroccan work in the Arab Design Now show, including the work of Hamza Kadiri, for example, who's an, a fantastic uh, furniture sculptor, carver. Uh, from Morocco. So that would be sort of the westmost end of the region that we're looking at. And then it extends all the way, of course, to Qatar and the Gulf region. Uh, so it's a big part of the world, you know, um, that we're looking at. And so much talent. I might just mention uh, a few names here in case listeners might be familiar with them. Uh, we have the terrific furniture designers from Lebanon, from Beirut, which has been a center for furniture design uh, over the past few years. Uh, so, for example, Najla Alzain, who has a, an amazing uh, permanent installation at the Flag Plaza in Doha already, she'll be a part of the Arab Design Now show. Also, David and Nicola, who are a great partnership operating out of Beirut, will be featured. And then I might also uh, put a particular emphasis on the work of Naqsh Collective. That's a pair of sisters, uh, Nisreen and Nurneen Abdudail. And um, they're actually in Jordan, but of Palestinian origin, uh, which of course is uh, highly relevant to all of us at the moment. And they are looking back at the uh, tradition of Tatris, uh, the sort of local craft traditions um, in textiles and pattern making, and then exploring that in their design. And then also in Arab design now, obviously we're featuring Qatari designers, um, of whom there are many and all, uh, you know, more every year it seems, more talent coming out of VCU and establishing themselves in studios. Um, I'll just mention a few of those names. Aisha El Sawadi really uh, must be mentioned first and foremost. She's also the head of the Liwan Design Studios, uh, which is this beautiful, just magical space that she's created uh, for fellow artists and designers uh, just south of M7 near the design district. Um, also, we have Mariam Ohamaid, a fantastic textile designer and carpet designer. Uh, Azma Derwish, um, who also has been creating sort of vital retail uh, design uh, project within M7, uh, basically the museum store of the museum, but that doesn't really do it credit because it's a really fantastic uh, showcase for contemporary design that's being created in, in the country called Studio 7. And then I also want to mention Alia Rashid's uh, project, which is From, uh, which is a kind of furniture incubation platform for designers working in Qatar and we'll have a special showcase for what they're doing and they've been so impressive and so successful uh, showing their newly developed designs in uh, Milan during Salone de Mobile, the big furniture fair that happens in Milan every year. So they've been very active there and it's a pleasure to be able to give them a you know kind of special platform during the biennial. I'm really impressed that you have learned all the names and what they're doing. You've become very familiar with the talent uh, in our region and I really look forward to seeing you know the realization of the ideas that have been presented over the past uh, month. 
Now, if we go back to you, Glenn, and the work that you have done, you talk extensively about material intelligence and the idea that objects tell stories. If you were to single out one object you have in encountered in your curation of design, or how you've mentioned many, what would it be and what story does it tell? Mm. Just one work. One, I know you can't, it's like I'm asking you to choose your favorite child, but if there's one piece that you think challenges this notion of material intelligence, if any, what, what would it be and what story, what does it tell? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hard to pick, of course. I'm actually going to talk a, a little bit more about the Weaving Songs project. Um, so that's not really in the MENA region technically because it's from Afghanistan, so it's a little further east, but obviously very strongly in cultural communication with the Arab region. Um, and as I mentioned in passing earlier, we're working with an artist called Mariam Omar, who's based in London but is originally Afghani herself. And she's created, it's not one object, it's actually a whole suite of carpet designs, rug designs, uh, with the support of the great nonprofit enterprise Turquoise Mountain, who really got their start in Afghanistan, although they've also worked in other parts of the world where craft communities are under a lot of pressure, a lot of um, duress. And they're really trying to create opportunities for those craftspeople that otherwise wouldn't exist. So what they've done here is to orchestrate the creation of these carpets by Mariam Omar by a group of female weavers who are in the Bamiyan region of Afghanistan. And the carpets actually tell the story of that region. So they go from the sky through the mountains and the, I guess in the Gulf area, you would call them the wadis, the sort of gullies and valleys, and then down into the village itself with the looms and the women sitting next to one another um, doing their work. And it's all inspired by songs that are actually sung while this craft creation is happening. And so the exhibition, which will be in the unfinished theater at M7, shows those carpets alongside the singing and also the lyrics of these songs, which we're going to be placing on the walls. So it's going to be a kind of immersive opportunity to step into this kind of world of craft, um, which is so you know, historically resonant and uh, powerful, particularly given what's happened in recent years uh, in Afghanistan, you know, the terrible experiences of war and dislocation that people have had. And it just seemed like a really important aspect for the biennial, given the diplomatic and humanitarian work that Qatar has been doing in that part of the world, really leading in the effort in many ways to uh, try to help, you know, people who have been affected by the conflict. And so it, it feels like a, a particularly significant part of the biennial to me. It's really a fascinating culture, the Afghani culture. I mean, when Richard Serra was commissioned by us for his Sculpture 7, he was inspired by a first century Afghani minaret uh, that you can see at the Museum of Islamic Art, you know, at the end of the park. But also one of the artists that uh, worked at the reinstallation of the Museum of Islamic Art is also an Afghani artist called Ali Baba. And so having a different element of Afghani uh, culture and artisanship and craftsmanship in partnership with Turquoise Mountain is really fascinating, I think, um, experience for our visitors, but also an introduction of a different uh, perspective of the richness of Afghani culture. Uh, that has existed for centuries. You have also, Glenn, argued for the crucial importance of artisanal values to modern life. If you could expand that statement, why, in your opinion, are artisans still so vital to life in 2024? Well, I think it is partly that it grounds us into the material world, as we were talking about earlier. But there is another thing which we maybe haven't mentioned, which is just the way that a handmade object will connect you to another person and therefore the life and experience that that person has. And this is an old story, I guess, going right back to the Industrial Revolution. But, you know, for all kinds of understandable reasons, mostly having to do with efficiency, once you bring in machine production and then automation and now recently artificial intelligence – you have the sense that things are being made not necessarily outside the control of human beings, because of course human beings do stand at the origin of the process in many ways. That's what design is or what it was invented to be, you know, creating forms to be mass reproduced. Uh, that was the original definition of industrial design. But what you lose there is the sense of contact and in a way the ethical obligations or understanding 
or connection that you have to the person who made that thing. And I think it's really telling that when people come to see Arab Design Now or the other elements of Design Doha, they're going to actually see very few things that are mass produced. It, most of the things that they see will, in fact, be made by hand. And that's because those objects seem to be the ones that tell the most powerful stories and get across the experiences and personal viewpoints and aesthetic sensibilities of those people most strongly. You know, it's just the way it is. <laughs> you curate the best possible selection of design from the region, and you realize that you've also made a craft show at the same time. And there's just something very, very intriguing about that to me, that craft, despite all these other possibilities of ways of making things through machine learning and machine production, it still seems to be something that we can't do without and provides us the greatest meaning. And I, I'm always inclined to think that there's something fundamentally humane about that that really deserves celebration. This is all really exciting. And I just want to um, have one more question for you, Glenn, about uh, the experience that I personally had with you during a moment of world crisis during the pandemic, you know, during COVID. Mm -hmm. You launched mm -hmm. um, a design and dialogue uh, series where you had conversations with leading designers, curators, um, collectors. I mean, first of all, I mean, we were going through a pandemic. What inspired this and wh what did you find rewarding about these different conversations mm. with uh, designers and curators from different parts of the world? Well, you know, it seems like a long time ago now, but you'll remember we were all stuck in our rooms wherever we were. And I was talking, of course, over the phone and Zoom with Mark Benda of Friedman Benda Gallery, who, by the way, are helping us a lot with the with Design Doha, both with Choi and Joris Larman's uh, commissions, especially. Um, but he and I were thinking, well, what can we do to keep the conversation going, really? And we came up with this idea of having a regular interview program offered for free. Anybody can watch it. And, you know, all the recordings are still there on, on the web. So just Google design and dialogue and you'll see there are over 120 of them that you can watch. And it just was initially a way to keep talking to one another at a time of isolation. But what happened was that it really developed to be much more than that. I think a key moment happened in, the United States here when we had the murder of George Floyd. And of course, there was a huge uprising of consciousness and widespread uh, protest, and rightly so, about racial uh, violence in this country. And one reaction that we had to that was to inflect the design and dialogue series uh, to incorporate uh, voices who might not have been central to the design discipline, um, but should be. And we brought on Stephen Burks, who was the leading, um, really pioneering African-American uh, product designer to be a co-host of mine. And we made a really concerted effort to start bringing on uh, people of color to the program as guests. And it really became this amazing journey of discovery uh, of those voices and, of course, the insights and complexity that you can have in a single conversation with a single designer over an hour. Just that format, I think, was really, really inspiring for me and kind of kept me going through the pandemic. And I guess if I were to say one thing about what it taught me, it would just be the importance of dialogue, of talking to one another. You know, design at the end of the day, it is about the objects and how beautiful they are, how technically achieved they are. You know, there's a lot of value in them just as inanimate things. But ultimately, what's really important about them is the way they keep conversation going between us all, including the conversation that you and I are having right now, Your Excellency, you know, it's the way that the objects bring us together that I think really matters. No, and you know, one thing I think that Qatar does so well is continue to engage in dialogue, especially in moments of crisis and conflict. So mm. I think this is another dimension of dialogue through design and craftsmanship and representing the voices of people from areas that are probably in conflict or are ignored or are um, undervalued. And I think it's really important. Um, and as you said, the pandemic feels like such a long time away, but actually it was not that uh, long ago that people could not engage in dialogue and meet in person. And so I think um, the moment uh, of gathering everybody through the design Doha Biennale that's happening very soon is really an exciting moment because I am I'm certain that every visitor will have so many new discoveries because a lot of the designers we've supported don't have representations. They don't have galleries. And this is an opportunity also for people in the private sector and in the industry 
to set up galleries like the ones that exist in the West and support these designers so that they can be represented and empowered to represent our Arab mm. heritage or even contemporary dialogue or design, if you like, in new projects. Whether they're real estate, hospitality, um, urban design, public parks, there's just too many opportunities in our region and so much talent. And if we can achieve linking industry with talent, I think the impact of that in our economy will be very, very strong. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you do kind of need to make it easy for people. You need to give them avenues. Um, and so I think all this research that we've been able to do and you know, really putting together an exhibition like Arab Design Now, the biennial as a whole, it really presents such a strong impression of design from the region. Um, and hopefully it will make it a lot easier for these practitioners to begin showing their work um, outside the region as well, you know, in other parts of the world. I hope you don't mind me saying one thing about the conflict that we've been seeing recently in Gaza, because, you know, when it first happened, we actually had a conversation internally about whether it was appropriate to go ahead with Design Doha on the uh, schedule that we had established. And ultimately, we decided that precisely for the reasons you said, Your Excellency, it's so important to keep the dialogue and conversation going. And it actually was an important time to gather together, um, not necessarily in a spirit of celebration, but in a spirit of connection and sharing and showing the incredible creative prowess of the region. It just seems like a, actually a really, really important time to be doing that, um, despite the tragedy that's still unfolding. So that's really, for me personally anyway, just made the biennial all the more meaningful. No, thank you for saying that. And I think that's why the decision of uh, staying with the Biennale, because this is a moment of empowerment. As I said, many of the designers that are represented at the Biennale are not represented uh, through any galleries. And I think empowering them, supporting them, really um, giving them an avenue to to express their creativity and also gather the right kind of people to spot this talent, I think is really crucial and important in this moment of time. Um, Glenn, it has been a pleasure speaking to you today. I really um, enjoy our interactions and I learn from our conversations each time. And I hope that people do listen to the design and dialogue that's available and learn more about design and the importance of design thinking in our everyday lives. And um, come enjoy the, the creativity we have in the Arab world. We have so much talent to celebrate. So thank you so much. Likewise, it's been such a pleasure and indeed an honor to be um, serving as artistic director of this great event. I hope uh, people can make it to Doha and see in person. Thank you. And I can't wait to see what 2026 brings. So thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Glenn. Bye-bye. <laughs>